the book of Isaiah as we walk through this book verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, the gospel according to Isaiah. This morning we will be in chapters 31 and 32. Bible's in the back if you don't have one, reading from the ESV English Standard Version. Isaiah chapter 31 and 32 is where we will find ourselves this morning. So at this point, we get to chapter 31 and 32. Uh, the Israel, the northern tribes, uh, the ten northern tribes, also known as Ephraim, has been conquered. Samaria, their capital city, has been decimated. God used the Assyrian nation, an empire, to, to discipline Israel due to their stubborn rebellion. The two southern kingdoms, or the two southern tribes, I should say, make up one kingdom. His name is Judah. Two kingdoms to the south is Judah. Isaiah has been warning them over and over again concerning their covenant-breaking sins. And now Assyria, after decimating Israel, is working their way south. They are at the doorstep of Judah, the two southern tribes. Ultimately, God will spare them at this point, around 701 B.C., maybe a little uh, before that. God will spare them for now, and will use the Babylonian uh, Empire years to come to teach Judah their lesson. If you remember, several years earlier, Judah and their king at that time was Ahaz. Ahaz, Judah's king, made an alliance with Assyria because of the threat of Israel against Judah. Obviously, it didn't help. Because Assyria, even though they made an alliance with Assyria, an alliance uh, that didn't work because Assyria now is at the doorstep of Jerusalem. It's not working. It didn't work. And God will and does choose to teach his people a lesson. Now, the alliance didn't we work. We know that Assyria is right at the door of Judah, the southern kingdom, but, and there's many reasons as we've gone through the scriptures, but one of the things we've seen over and over, the main reason the alliance didn't work is because God is sovereign over all the nations, and God in his sovereignty chose to take Assyria to march west-south and to discipline not only Israel, but also Judah. They are, it was a way in which God was teaching the nation, his people, to not trust in other things, but to trust in God. To turn from their idolatry of running to other places rather than trusting in the Lord. And what we've been witnessing over and over is, this, uh, is the reality of not only God's holiness and sovereignty and holy and pure and otherness, but also the expectation of God's people to walk in his light. We've seen that over and over again. Isaiah's pointing out their sin. But we've also seen God's kindness and mercy and grace. And now, especially over the past few weeks, we've seen his patience with his people. Even in the midst of, this, of his justifiable anger and wrath toward his rebellious creatures, he loves them and he reaches out to them not only in love and mercy and grace, but he now continues to give them hope. A chance to repent, to turn and be forgiven, the chance to acknowledge their sin and their waywardness and their faithlessness and the opportunity to be restored to God by God's mercy. That's the good news of Isaiah. That's the good news of the gospel. The, Isaiah, uh, the gospel according to Isaiah. A chance to, to acknowledge sin and to repent and turn to God. Jesus Christ himself, who is the gospel, came into the scene in Mark chapter 1, began his earthly ministry, calling people to repent. The time is fulfilled, Jesus said, and the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is here. Repent, turn, and believe in the gospel. In other words, the king of the kingdom has come. The one that the prophets, the prophets talk about, Isaiah, like Isaiah, was, was here. Therefore, repent and believe. Stop turning to false and functioning idols. Turn to the one true God. He has come in the flesh to usher in, to inaugurate his kingdom through his perfect life, his, his atoning death, his, his glorious resurrection and ascension. And that's what the good news of, the, of, of Isaiah is. That's what the good news of the gospel is. The king has come. The savior is here. He's full of mercy. He's full of grace. He's full of love. Isaiah, though pointing out our sin, also points out our hope. And that's the coming king. The sovereign Lord, the Christ who will come and cleanse and forgive his people. As we get into chapter 31 this morning, 
Turn your Bibles there. We immediately see that chapter 1 is an extension or continuation of chapter 30. Judah's king is not Ahaz. Judah's king now is Hezekiah. Ahaz was his father. And although Ahaz made a sinful alliance with Assyria, Ahaz's son Hezekiah, who is now king of Judah, has made a sinful allegiance, alliance, allegiance with Egypt. Can't do it with Assyria. Assyria is right at the doorstep. They're afraid of Assyria now, Judah is. So, uh, so Hezekiah goes and makes an alliance with Egypt. Now, I mentioned this before, and let me say it again uh, this week as well, just to remind us. There's nothing wrong with getting help. I was wondering who was talking to me. I wasn't sure. There's nothing wrong with getting help, right? When you're in trouble, when you're in need, when, you, when, when you're, when you're uh, you know, f- drowning in, 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 in difficulties, in hardship, in, and, and, and you're, 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 you're looking for help. You're like, I, I, I need help. Nothing wrong with that. When you're in trouble, life becomes unbearable for us. In fact, Scripture says to us in Galatians 6 that we are to bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, we share each other's burdens, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. The question that we must ask ourselves when life becomes hard, when we feel like we are drowning, is this. Am I seeking help, and the help that I'm seeking, is it going to promote faith and God, trust in God, or is the help I'm seeking actually just self-promotion? That's the question. Am I seeking to know the will of God through the word of God, or am I like the Judaites looking to hear, look what it says in chapter 30, verse 20, smooth things and prophecies of illusions? Family, you and me, we have a tendency to seek out the help of those we know will tell us what we want to hear. Don't raise your hand. For the time is coming, Paul told uh, young t- Pastor Timothy, when people will not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. We fall in that category from time to time. And will turn away from listening to the truth. It may be hard. Turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Good godly wisdom, good godly counsel, good godly principle comes from the word and from others in the community. And they can promote faith. But we have to be careful. Oftentimes we're seeking just what we want to hear so that we continue in our ways. Our hearts are deceptive. We need to listen to the word. We need to listen to the spirit. We need to listen to those who will be honest with us. Rather than continue down the road of idolatry. Rather than continuing on the road, as we'll see in chapter 30 to 31, the road of idolatry and self-interest. So, and that takes us right to 31 as a continuation of their idolatry. Chapter 31. Three things. Antidote. Faithlessness. Arrival of the king. Anticipation of the kingdom. Very simple. Antidote. The faithlessness. Arrival of the king. Anticipation of the kingdom. So let's look at number one. Woe. You see again. Hear the word of God. Woe. Again. Lament. Brokenness. Judgment coming. A funeral is going to come. Chapter 31 verse 1. Woe. To those who go down to Egypt for help. And rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words but will rise against the house of the evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are men or man and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is help will fall, and they will all perish together. For thus the Lord said to me, as a lion or a, li- or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called against him, he is not terrified by their shouting or daunting at their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its hill. Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem and will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. Verse 6. Turn to me, or turn to him, talking to God, talking about God. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. Israel is, is a generic term. He's really talking to Judah, but to God's people. O children of Israel. For in that day, 
Everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrian shall fall by the sword, not of man. And a sword, not of man, shall devour him. And he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers, prince, princes, officers, desert the standard in panic declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. This theme, faithlessness of God's people and the faithfulness of God just keeps popping up. Verse 6, again, another theme keeps popping up. Uh, it's very consistent in Isaiah's message is a chance to repent, a chance to turn. If we could sum up everything that Isaiah has to say so far to his people to now, we would just simply say Isaiah is calling God's people to what? Trust God. Trust God. Stop being unfaithful. Stop your faithlessness. Why is this a continual theme? Can we ask that this morning? Why is it? Could it be that we are fickle people? And we need to hear it over and over again. We stand with great faith one day, and the next day we're worried, concerned, and, and, and full of fear. We're not walking moment by moment. And trust we need to hear the same old thing. Trust God. We learned last week that Judah didn't. They sent the convoy of donkeys and camels filled with riches and treasures down to Egypt, hoping that they would protect them. Chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. And Judah sends his convoy of riches and treasures, hoping that, that Egypt will give them refuge, shelter, and protection. And God declared then, and now, as he does in chapter 31, that that's not going to help. That, that, that their faithlessness is not going to be awarded. They're, they're not going to have the protection. They're, they're, they fail to look at the Holy One of Israel. They fail to look at him in verse 31, uh, chapter 31, verse 1. And it's going to be met with disaster. In fact... It says that they think they are so wise, but look at verse 2. Yet he is wise, and he will bring disaster. So they got all these plans and everything that they're going to do, and they're going to go down to Egypt. They're going to find protection and pay for it, like the mafia of the old days. And yet it will become a disaster. The lack of trust in God and their foolish trust in things of this world, they're trusting in horses, trusting in chariots. It will, only, it will not only cause the destruction of Egypt, but look what it says in verse 3. They will all perish together. They will all perish together. Only God and His Spirit will do work. Only God and His Spirit can bring them protection and shelter and refuge. This warning is to remind us that we are not in charge. That, that, that we are not to trust in human wisdom. We are not to trust in physical strength. We're not to trust ultimately in what we have and what we possess or in any political alliances. Our trust must be in God. And by making this alliance with Egypt, the officers or the princes, verse 9 of Judah, are just trusting in things that will not matter. Again, not that nations should not protect themselves. It's not that nations should not provide protection for their people. It's not that nations should not develop and, and, and put money into things that will protect their people, not saying that. But what they're saying is that ultimately, at the end of the day, nations should not trust and rely completely on that. That God alone determines and directs the course of history. We get to verses 4 and 5. Difficult, somewhat difficult to interpret, but Look at me in verses 5. I think the first analogy of this lion, the first analogy of this, of this God likened to a lion growling over his prey, unafraid of the shepherds, which the, here the shepherds is Egypt. Not least worried or concerned about their threat or their presence means that God will accomplish that in which he set out to do. God is not afraid. He's going to teach Judah to trust the Lord. He's not threatened by any silly alliance that they're going to make with Egypt as if now I can't do what I was set out to do. The second analogy that God likens himself to a bird protecting his nest is the Lord's protection over his people as well. As a, as a bird hovers over uh, the, 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 the young, uh, ready to attack and protect their young. Here we see the Lord is saying that I, the Lord is saying through Isaiah that he is both a lion and a bird. 
to Judah. Interesting. A lion will attack its, its prey it, 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 with intent and purpose. God will chastise with intention and purpose. The shouts of Egypt are not going to change anything. And as a bird, he's going to protect. As a bird, God is going to also protect Judah. Assyria will not, and you can read it in, in, as we get later on in, this chapter, in these chapters, you'll see Assyria is not going to demolish as they did Israel, the northern kingdom. Israel is going, was demolished, but Assyria is not going to demolish Israel. Excuse me, Judah. I'm getting that mixed up. I'm getting you mixed up too. God allowed Assyria to destroy Israel. God brought the Assyrian nation to the doorstep of Judah, but he's going to stop them. So as a lion, I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to be intimidated by, by, by what you think you can do. You can run to Egypt if you want. It's not going to intimidate me. But I also know how far I'm going to let the Assyrian nation go. Like a bird, I'm going to hover. I'm going to watch. And family, you know what that tells us? That tells us that God's hand of discipline and love is like a perfect, skilled surgeon that knows exactly what he's doing. Like a lion and like a bird. He's ruler over the universe. He will not be outsmarted or outpowered. And now God declares that that will happen. And he commands in verse 6, the people of God to what? Repent. There's that arm of rescue. There's that loving response. Turn from your sins and I will rescue you. Even though their rebellion is deep, he alone can help. And he invites them and he invites you and he invites me to return to him. Once again, notice, like last week, genuine repentance, genuine turning uh, will produce fruit. Will produce fruit. Look at verse 7. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For in that day, everyone shall what? Cast away his idols of silver and idols of gold. Okay? They're, they're going to... They're gonna, they're gonna, Throw away that which was sinfully made for you. Now, last week, we talked about idolatry. We said idols are not in our day and age, although sometimes there are. Just go to Rome, and you'll see statues that are being worshipped. But mostly the things that we worship are not necessarily stone and wood. It's, it's the things we said last week that are inflated. The things that, that are not only inflated, but they function as God to us. Even good things that seize our hearts. Anything that we have this over-attachment to, that we love and pursue in the place of God, could be an idol. A functioning idol, functioning for us as a savior, as our justification. I mentioned last week, Tim Keller. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart, if I have that, I feel, I feel like I have meaning. If I have that, I have value, significance, and worth. And I'm secure. And what that is, what you're looking to, can be an idol. It could be health, it could be children, grandchildren, relationships, hopes, pleasure, uh, a, a creed. Anything more central to our contentment and joy, satisfaction, and ultimate treasure, meaning in life, and our identity that's outside of God is an idol to us. And idols are costly. It says silver and gold must be cast away. They're costly. Calvin says, John Calvin said, true conversion does not ask the price. True conversion does not ask the price. There's a price to pay. The genuine, we just... Cast those things aside. And when one turns and trusts God, look what it says. The enemy will be destroyed, verses 8 and 9. Mighty Assyria will be devastated, not, not by human means. In fact, if you read the historical account later on in Isaiah, and I mentioned last week and the week before, 2 Kings, you read that the angel of death, or the angel of the Lord, came and destroyed 185 men in that battle. 185 Assyrians died by the hand of God. The Assyrian match, army is no match for God. And when Judah turns to God and, and destroys their idols, a Syrian nation falls. It's a supernatural work of God. It's a supernatural work of God. You can read 185,000. Sometimes, sometimes, God, <laughs> at least in my life, he waits till I'm done trying. Sometimes, you know what, he's going to show up in a mighty way. When we let go of the reins. 
Isaiah, excuse me, Abraham, 90 something, 99. We're, we're gone. We're beyond. We're, we're beyond human ability. God shows up. The supernatural work and deliverance of God appears at the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, at Jericho, the Gideon story, defeating the Philistines. Over and over we see God's hand, mighty hand, show up when there's nothing else and no one else to turn to. When people, when people believe that they could save themselves and they could work really hard and get themselves out of the mess they're in on their own effort, they effectively dethrone God in their lives and bring destruction upon themselves, as God says, then you go and do. When you're done, I'll, I'll step in. The antidote to faithlessness is to turn to God. Turn to God in repentance. Instead of rebelling against his, his, his wisdom, his instruction, his word, turn to him. Reject all other sources of trust in your final place. Do not make allegiances with things of this world. They're not going to rescue you. They're not going to rescue you. Cast off your idols. Those things that function in your life that say, if I got to have, I got to have that in order to feel worthwhile. The antidote to faithlessness is to trust God, to seek his will, to know his word, to follow his instructions, and depend on him for salvation. Number two, the arrival of the king. Because that's what this is pointing to. The king of kings. Don't, don't trust in other nations. Trust in the king. Verse 1 of chapter 32. Behold. Look. See. A king will reign in righteousness. And princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind. A shelter from the storm. Like streams of water in a dry place. Like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Isaiah now will contrast this, this future king that will come and his princes and his executives with the present condition of the foolish politicians, the, the faithless men who are giving bad advice, making stupid alliances with, with Egypt. The kings and these princes will not panic, as chapter 31, verse 9 tells us, but will rule righteously. They will be, they will be men of integrity. They will be people who have a, a source of, of provision and refreshment for God's people. Providing all that they need, a hiding place, a shelter, water a dry, in a dry place, shade. A day will come, says Isaiah, when the king will be divinely enabled to do what kings are called to do. What everyone knows a true king ought to do. Live and rule in righteousness. And flowing from him, there'll be peace. Flowing from him, people experience righteousness. We know, family, we know who that king is. We, we met this king. Isaiah has talked about this king over and over. The one who embodies righteousness. God's future messianic king that Isaiah is speaking about. Who will reign and rule and establish an eternal kingdom. A rule of righteousness by implementing the justice of God on the earth is King Jesus. We met him in Isaiah chapter 9. A child is born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And what? Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David this king will sit. And over his kingdom, he'll establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth forevermore. That's the king. Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come from the stump of Jesse a shoot, a branch that will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear. And his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what I sees or decide disputes by what we hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with his rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. And faithfulness the belt of his loins. That's King Jesus. 
Isaiah chapter 16, one more. When the oppressor is no more and destruction has ceased, and he who tramples on the foot has vanished from the land, then a throne will be established in steadfast, has said, covenantal love. And on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. King Jesus. And the result of this, this king who's come is staggering. Look at me at verse 3. Then the eyes of those who will see, excuse me, who see will not be closed. The ears of those who will give ear, who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know. And the tongue of the stammers will hasten to speak distinctively. Eyes open, ears open, hearts open. And this prophetic word about this future king is meant to bring God's people, listen, in, in a midst of disaster and destruction all around them, is meant to bring God's people hope. Hope resulting in trust. Th does it change your perspective? Does it change our perspective? Does it change your heart, my heart, when it, when, when it comes to fears or failures or functioning saviors? This is our God. This is our king. And hope should change everything. Let me illustrate it for you. Many hurting people gathered together for a memorial service one day in Pennsylvania where flight, United Flight 93 crashed on September 11, uh, 2001. A woman by the name of Lisa Beamer was one, a widow of one of the men who led a revolt against the hijackers. And she was there at this memorial service in Pennsylvania. And she wrote this after the memorial. She says, I couldn't help but compare this service to the one in Cranberry the day before. Todd's memorial service has been so uplifting, so inspiring, because the emphasis had been on the hope in the midst of crisis. On Monday, as I listened to the well-intentioned speakers, who were doing their best to comfort, but with little, if any, direct reference to the power of God to sustain us, I felt I was sliding helplessly down a, mount, a high mountain into a deep crevice. As much as I appreciated the kindness of the wonderful people who tried to encourage us that afternoon was actually one of the lowest points in my grieving. It wasn't the people or even the place. Instead, it struck me how hopeless the world is when God is factored out of the equation, end quote. The hope we have in the coming king. And you know what? As Christ followers... As Christ followers, our hope is actually more concrete because he already came once. He already came. Think of it this way. As Christ followers, we have already experienced the results, some of the results of the coming king of righteousness and the faithful leaders who, who submitted themselves to God. Our eyes were once closed to the truth of the gospel, the beauty of Christ. Our ears were once shut to the words of eternal life in the gospel. Our hearts chased after idols and foolishness. And we were ignorant, and our tongue spoke of self-glory. But now the coming of Christ, through the gospel, though, though we're not fully sanctified, our eyes have been opened to the truth of the gospel and the beauty and the glory of Christ. Our ears have been opened to the words of eternal life that we embrace. Our hearts are pursuing the glory of God, not our own glory. And when we speak, we speak of the love of God. That, dear family, is a foretaste of the future that is to come. It should give us hope, cause us to trust. Our only hope is in God. Behold, the king will come, reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. That's our hope. We get a taste of it now in the gospel. Now, verses 5 through 8, we see more consequences of this new righteous king. The fool, he says, will be, excuse me, the fool will no more be called noble. At that point, the fool is called noble. Nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly and his heart is busy with iniquity. To practice ungodliness, that's what the fool is doing. To utter error concerning the Lord. To leave the, the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to uh, deprive the thirsty of a drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He, he plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But, verse 8, he who is noble plans noble things. And on noble things he stands. When Once the people's eyes have been opened to the truth, they have a new understanding of reality, man. They, they will no longer follow the, and honor the foolish leaders, the scoundrels, the, the politicians, and, and royal uh, noble counselors. At some point, their eyes are opened. 
The people of Judah will see the folly of the wicked, the fool's advice, those who do evil and ungodliness. Come to understand that those who say they are motivated, we're here to help you, we care about you, really distorts God's way, leaving the craving of the hungry unsatisfied. It doesn't help. And to deprive the thirsty of a drink, it's not doing us any good. You would think this was written yesterday. <laughs> but the noble person stands. And the Hebrew word noble is a character, someone who is generous and has a big heart. Someone who knows that the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God supplies all that he needs, and therefore he's generous with others. That's the noble one. Unlike the fools who say, I'll take care of you and have nothing, this one trusts in the Lord. The Lord will be his stay. He'll endure because God will make him stand and will help him to stand. But not everybody's trusting and waiting on this king. Sadly, some reject him. Verse 9. Do I have verse 9 up here? Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a little more than a year, you will shudder, you complacent women. For the grape harvest fails. The fruit harvest will not come. I know it's was launching on women's ministry. I'm sorry, but it just fell on this month. Isaiah is saying the women of Jerusalem are illustrations of what spiritual complacency looks like. The word complacency is used three times in this, from verses 9 to 11. And there's nothing wrong with a, a quiet life. No, nothing wrong with quiet contentment. But, but we have to remember what that looks like. Again, Paul told Timothy that there are those who teach a different doctrine and don't agree with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords, that goes with godliness. They're puffed up, they're conceited, they're unhealthy, they crave controversy and quarrels, they envy, uh, slander. They, there are constant uh, frictions among people who are depraved in mind, deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. What's most important wasn't the harvest time. What was most important is contentment in God. These women are living in a, in a false peace, a fleeting indulgence, and, and really just short-sightedness of what is yet to come. Ray Ortland said, the men at the royal court are wringing their hands over Assyria, right at the doorstep, fretting over a danger that God has already promised to take care of. The women at home can't see beyond the great bargains in the marketplace. They're not worried about anything. They represent the kind of happiness that will kill us. Earthly contentment with no longing for God. Time will come, a little over a year, the harvest, that, that time that's a joyous time, rejoicing time, will soon come to nothing. And the breaking of the covenant and the sin against God is, is brought upon the land as God chastises them. There'll be no harvest. It'll be empty. The prophet calls the women to mourn, verse 11. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Strip and make yourselves bare and tie sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people. Growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for all the joyous houses in the exult, exultant city. Time of rejoicing is now seen as not lasting very long. Sometimes it's times of prosperity when things are going well that we don't see the danger coming. We neglect God. Things go well. But God's calling them to mourn. I read this week, it's typical for women in the Northeast to, to, to take their, rip their clothes, maybe have an undergarment, and just pound on their chest as a sign of mourning, lamenting over the brokenness. And God says, listen, you're rejoicing, but you need to lament. Verse 14 and 15. For the place is forsaken, and the populous city deserted. Let's see if I can get, oh, sorry. Oh, can you go back to 
second one. For the palace is forsaken, the populous city deserted. The hill and the watchtower become dense forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. We see four images. Quickly, and we'll jump to our last point. Forsakenness. First, there's, a, there's royal residence that's been abandoned. Second, the populous city is forsaken. Third, the abandonment of defenses. So you have the, you have the city, the palace, the, 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 the people, and now the defense, the watchtower, and finally the inhabit, inhabitation overrun by donkeys and wild animals. The decimation and forsakenness of the city, abandonment of everything in Jerusalem. So let me, let me leave this section. We jump to the next section here in our last section. Let, let me leave with you with these thoughts and something you could think about. Okay? Some people, the reason why we don't, I don't, you don't, sometimes people don't, respond to warnings about what is unseen or yet to be experienced is because we have lack of faith of the one to whom is issuing the warning. Does that make sense? In other words, will that really happen? Could, could, could someone who, who says, listen, you need to be warned, do they have the authority, do they have the sovereignty, do they have the power to actually carry out that in which, they're being, which you're being warned? If, if, you're, if you're saying, yeah, my dad's not going to do that, my mom's not going to do that. God is speaking here. Warning. And there's a warning in the gospel. The gospel warns us of the coming judgment of God. First Thessalonians 5. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come. It will come on them as labor pains come upon like a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Second Peter, the apostle writes, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. You know God is patient toward you. God is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. The authority, sovereignty, almighty power of God has spoken. So although the warnings are dismissed, Although they seem to be delayed, diminished to some, yet Jesus says, come. Come to him. And by grace you'll be saved. By grace you will, you will escape the coming judgment of God. See the beauty. See the glory. See the all-satisfying Christ. King Jesus, who will replace fear with hope. He will replace empty idolatry with true fulfillment and joy. The foretaste of the future that is to come is the king who has come. But now look, he goes further into it. Verse 15. Until the spirit is poured out or is poured upon us from on high. Now, all of a sudden he just, he just changes. He, he, he now shifts from disaster, abandonment, forsakenness. Until the spirit is poured out poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. A fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effects of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet places. From forsakenness to prophecy now turns to salvation. The promised king and the promised kingdom will come and transform the world by reversing the conditions that Isaiah just spoke about in verses 9 through 14. Notice that. In verses 9 and 10, there's a sense, a false sense of complacency and security. But now verse 18, they're secure and whole. In verse 10, there's no harvest. In verse 15, there's a fertile field. In verse 14, the city is desolate. Now verse 18, they'll dwell in homes and quietness. In verse 14, the flocks are overrunning the city. In verse 20, they roam free. Remember what we said. We said in chapter 11 when I read earlier, Isaiah, how the coming spirit, when the spirit is poured out, it'll be, it's a major incident. It, it takes a major role in this messianic kingdom and this messianic era that will come, King Jesus. King Jesus. 
And Isaiah is saying now that the Spirit gives life. The Spirit revitalizes the created order back to where it was. The original design and purposes. Instead of desolation, there is fruitation. Where there was once thorns and briars, now there are lush forests. And this picture that God over and over in His Word, and in particular in Isaiah, is saying to us is that when the Spirit comes, when the Messianic age comes, it will be far more richer, far more glorious, far more fruitful than anything man can cultivate. The true blessing that God gives to mankind, not, not some small insignificant drop of the Spirit, is being poured upon. The outpouring that washes away complacency like a flood, replacing counterfeit joy with real joy, real patience, quietness, security, and safety forever. Not by military armies, not by scheming alliances with so-called wise men, but by the marvelous work and power of Almighty God. The Spirit is poured out. Notice they didn't earn it. Notice there's nothing Judah has done. But God in his grace pours it out on them. And nature and people will change. Isaiah talked about this in chapter 1. He says, I will restore. He's talking about the Messianic kingdom. I will restore thy judges as at the first and counselors at the beginning. In other words, going back. Afterwards, the city will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. When the Spirit is poured out, listen, when the Spirit is poured out upon Jerusalem, his God's saving spiritual power, he will change everything. It will produce righteousness and, and, and the result of righteousness that permeates the community as well. We see that in this text. And family, listen now. Listen. It has already begun. I believe we see this has already begun at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And continues to be poured out onto God's elect that are given the Holy Spirit at conversion. You see, at the cross, the justice of God has been satisfied. Sin has been atoned for. The righteous requirement that's required by God to be reconciled to Him has been accomplished in Christ's perfect life and given to us, imputed to us by faith in Him. And now the hostility that we had with God because of our sin has been replaced with real peace. Romans 5.1, therefore we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the Holy Spirit in the New Testament has been described as something that's been given to us as a gift as he's poured out upon us for the day of our salvation that we are sealed for the day of salvation. That's our confidence. That's our security. Ephesians 1.13, in Christ you also have heard the truth of the gospel of your salvation. You believed in him. You were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who's our guarantee of the inheritance. We will require, excuse me, acquire possession of it in the end to the praise of his glory. The Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit is poured out on the church, as people are filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues and, and known languages of other, of other nations, stands up and quotes Joel. You know, you know, you know the, the, the quote. In the last day, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter takes something Joel talked about in the last days and applies it to Pentecost. The reason is, the reason is, the last days has begun. Don't let anybody tell you they're watching the newspaper and now they think they're in the last days. Tell them they don't know their Bible. The last days begin with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus until his coming again. That's the Bible says is the last day. During those last days, the Spirit of God will be poured out. The pouring out of God's Spirit is a distinctive mark of the new covenant. The future of this promised age has already begun. And like Peter, Isaiah did not indicate that the prophecy was exhausted by this outpouring. But there's a time and this character and this, this picture and this pouring out of the Spirit will take place when Israel is brought back to God and the Spirit is poured out upon this nation. And it will keep them safe and secure. Ortland says this. God is keeping this promise. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. Sometimes with astonishment. And abundance. He began at Pentecost and he continues to pour out his spirit today. He pours his very love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we boast in our suffering with an unbeatable hope. 
the lordship of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit are the secret power of God's people and nothing else. It speaks about the gospel in the time that God is pouring out a spirit on, on his people. Now, it also speaks of the outpouring of the spirit in the millennial reign of Christ. As Israel is gathered together in Matthew 24, the spirit will be poured out according to uh, Zechariah 12 and converted. The land will, will, will be a place where the Messiah will reign and the conditions of the millennial will be perfect, perfect physically, spiritually, time of peace, comfort, obedience, There'll be holiness, Christ will reign and rule, there'll be truth as Christ rules in his kingdom, in his thousand year reign. Now for my amillennial friends that are here, who don't believe in a literal, physical, on earth reign of Christ, we all agree that we know that whether it's after the millennial reign of Christ, thousand year reign, or the coming of the final kingdom, which they hold to, we agree on the same thing, Christ will come, Christ will reign, Christ will rule, he will he will set up his eternal kingdom, and Christ is calling everyone everywhere now to come to him, to turn, to turn, to turn away from false idols. Idols. He fulfilled righteousness. He lived without sin. He gave us his righteous life by faith for those who trust him. But here's the thing, family, and we'll close on this. We have to acknowledge our sin. We have to acknowledge our faithlessness and rebellion. We have to turn from it. We've got to believe and trust and rely not on other things for our salvation, but the person work of Christ. He died as our substitute. He, he took on and absorbed God's wrath and justifiable anger toward our rebellion and faithlessness. And, and, and in that empty tomb, as he rose from the dead, he will forgive you and justify you. And when we repent of our sins, we stop, stop trying to justify ourselves and turn to God in faith. He will give us his spirit. He will pour out his spirit on us. It began in the gospel. I believe it will continue in the millennial reign. But we know in the consummation of the ages, God will reign and rule. Family, that's our hope. Family, that's our hope. As the band comes up, listen to this. It was, it was the last day of a feast. The last day of a great feast in Israel. The feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the great Hosanna, Hosanna Day. Come, Lord Jesus, Hosanna Day. It was harvest time. Israel had gotten probably millions of people. Three times a year, Jewish men were called to go to Jerusalem for three major festivals Feast of Tabernacle was one of them. It was a time when the people of God commemorated the provision of God. That Israel, when they were wandering in the desert for 40 years, God provided for them. And they would build booths and shelters outside. Small tabernacles. And they would live in them for a week during this festival. It was a time of, of recognizing God's provision. They would dress up with festival clothing. And they would celebrate in the temple every day. They had branches, you know, from Hosanna, from the story of Jesus. They had branches, palm branches in their hands. And they would shout and sing and music would play. And the priests would be there. And on the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would gather in the morning. The priests would get two golden uh, um, vessels. And they would sing and shout, dressed with festival clothing, branches. And they would go down to the Pool of Siloam, a place where there was living spring. And the priests would fill up these golden vessels, and the shouts of all the people, the celebration, and it would go back up into the temple on the altar where God's people met with God because there's always uh, an offering of substitution. Blood had to be shed as a, before they approached God. And this festival is going on, and they would sing what's called the Hallel, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks, Psalm 118 said, for the Lord is good. We remember his faithfulness. We remember all that he has done. And they would sing... With joy you will draw water from the well of salvation, Isaiah 12, 3. The, the symbol of pouring the water and the celebration was pointing to the expectation and hope that God would begin the messianic reign. That the spirit would be poured out. The water was symbolic of the spirit that would be poured out. And they waited for the salvation that God was going to do for his people. 
and they were celebrating and they were, and they were waving branches and they were singing, anticipating the time of salvation. The stream of living water will flow from the earth. And as they sang the songs, they anticipated the salvation of God. The song ended and everyone was completely silent. million people completely silent in the gathering sanctuary in the temple. Waiting. Hoping. Will this be the time? And then one person stands up. The Lord Jesus says out loud, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now that he said this was about the spirit, about those not only who believed in him would receive, those who believed in him would receive, for the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. In other words, he didn't go to the cross. But Jesus says, though, well, when I do and I am glorified, come to me and drink. Jesus points to himself as the fulfillment of the tabernacles, of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Messianic hope, life, new life, new satisfaction, heart longing to be satisfied, drinking in the well of Jesus, the water of Jesus. Why run to idols when Jesus can satisfy? Why thirst after things that could never, ever satisfy your hunger and your thirst? Run to Jesus. The ache in our heart is the love that we need from Jesus. He alone gives us hope. He alone can fulfill your heart. Faithlessness in our sin, the coming of our King, and the anticipation of what's going to come. Do you know Christ? We're going to respond. We're going to respond. I, I, I wrote what we're going to, responding to our last song. Let's stand together if we can. Jesus is better. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praise. We crown him, Lord. His kingly rules shattered and broken, the curse of sin's tyranny. Let, let's sing the King Jesus. He's the coming King. He's the King who's come. He's the King who's coming again. And let's worship Him. What are you holding on to today? Let it go. Burdens you have, fears you have today, now's the time. Let it go. Our promise is King Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can come and acknowledge your first coming, Lord Jesus to die for our sin, your second coming when you establish your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that we would by faith trust you today, that we drink deep of the waters of Christ. And Lord, that all the fears that we have, all the worries that we have, all the idols that we have had will be torn down, broken, and cast aside so that we may worship you, the one true and living God. And we ask all this in Jesus' good name. Amen.